Why don't you guys join us? Go ahead and stand up. We're going to start singing. We will sing, sing, sing and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. We will sing.
take this life and let it shine. Take this life and let it shine. Sing, lay me down again. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me says, let it be a joy, let a joy for my heart to say your will, Lord, your way. It will be a joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your will. soak that in right now. We just declared, Lord, lay us down. We want to lay ourselves down as a sacrifice to you, as an act of worshiping you in this place. And then beyond this place with our lives. Let it be a joy to say from our hearts, your will, your way always. And with the heavens, we declare our praises to you. And Lord, let our praises be your welcome. Let our hearts adore you. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your life we are here for you Jesus we are here for you to you our hearts are
your fire fall down Let us shout Be your anthem You're in now Fill the skies We are here for you We are here for you Well, as you know, these are, uh, these are weeks where we are thinking about transformation. And we're working through Romans chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. And today is week number five of that journey. And we are going to finish chapter number 12. So I'm kind of doing math. We were going to do this in about eight or nine weeks. This is week five, and we're finishing the first chapter. So I, I'm not sure that we're going to get it all done in eight or nine weeks. But we're learning some pretty powerful transformational truths Uh, some things that God wants to work in our lives in terms of changing us for His glory as we're working through chapter 12. Next weekend, by the way, uh, we're going to get into chapter 13. And when you read chapter 13, if you want to read ahead this week, you will notice that chapter 13 deals with secular governments and a Christian response and responsibility to secular government. And next weekend, we are going to be two weeks out from our election here in the United States. And next weekend, I'm going to be dealing with a Christian view of government and a Christian response and responsibility to our government. And that's some pretty timely stuff for our nation and for believers in our nation. So I hope you'll be here next weekend. Bring somebody with you. Be praying for that. But that's in chapter 13. Today, we're going to finish up chapter number 12. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking specifically about the ways in which God wants to change the way that we live 
by changing the ways in which we love. And we've discussed the fact that, that in chapter number 12, we are taught that what glorifies God is a transformed life. Let me remind you, in order for Christianity to work, I must be changed. That's an incredibly important truth. In order for Christianity to work in the world, Christians must be transformed. I didn't say in order to go to heaven. I said for Christ to be glorified, for Christianity to be the light of Christ in this world, then we must be transformed. Because Christ is never glorified publicly simply through a prayer of faith. Christ is glorified publicly through a life that is transformed. And the primary way that we change is by being uh, changed in the way that we love. Last weekend, as we began reading through chapter 12, verses 9, down through the end of the chapter, I told you that this is almost a big um, mass of commands about how to love who we love. And that there are specific commands for loving specific kinds of people. We called it almost like a strand of love DNA, you know, that, that Christ has deposited his love within us. And that in order to understand verses 9 through 21, you need to begin to pull apart that strand of love DNA and begin to look at all the different parts of it and the different commands. And we started doing that last week by, by learning to love people who are not so easy to love. Let me just remind you of the, of the three kinds of people that we learned about last week. First of all, if you look at uh, verse number 14, verse 14 says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And we learn that we love those who aren't so easy to love by blessing those that hound you. And I'm not going to re-preach that, but just remember, some people press into your life and they're, they're persecutors, and, uh, and we need to bless them. That's how we love them. And then secondly, we need to choose peace with those who harm us. This is what we discovered in verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight or honorable in the sight of all men. Some people bring harm to us. They bring evil to us. We need to choose peace with them. Seek to reconcile with them. And then thirdly, some people are our enemies. Verse number 20 Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. We love our enemies by being good to those who hate us. So how do we love people who are not so easy to love? We bless them, we choose peace with them, and we do good to them. This is the command of Scripture. And last week we talked about the fact that this is so incredibly counterintuitive. It's the most unnatural response to unloving people that we could imagine. And yet the reason that Christ calls us to live this way is because when we are kind to people who are unkind, when we're loving to people who are unloving, when we seek to reconcile with people who hurt us, it's that kind of love which sets our lives apart from the world. And that shines a bright light of witness on the glorious love of Jesus. Loving people who are unlovely, people who are not so easy to love. Now today we're going to continue to pull apart these commands about how we love who we love, and we're going to be talking about how to love people in the family, that is our family at home and our church family. How do we love one another? And some of you are automatically going to think, well, awesome, this is easy. Like if if I could deal with last week loving those unlovely people, I got this one without any problem at all. And yet I want to challenge you to not think that this is so automatic. It is not. Loving people that we call brother and sister, loving people in our family or our church family is very often, in a almost a weird sort of way, certainly a different sort of way, it can almost come more difficultly, come with more difficulty, I should say, than than loving those enemies. Because we tend to get complacent in the ways in which we love uh, one another, right? Right? Uh, have, you ever, uh, have you ever heard the story about the guy who told his wife, he said, when I, when I married you, I told you I'd love you, I told you I love you, and, uh, and I'd let you know if it ever changed, right? And so he said, I haven't told you any difference, so I love you. I don't feel the need to express it, I don't feel the need to show it, I don't feel the need uh, to, to, to say it, but you just know that I love you. Well, that's stinking thinking, okay? That's not the way we ought to operate in the church. Stinking thinking means bad theology, if you don't know that. That's not the way we operate in the church. And the commands that we're going to be given in Romans chapter 12 this morning are commands to love one another very, very specifically. Uh, Now, we're going to read the text. But just before we do, I want want to say a couple of things to you about this that are pretty important to me to say to you. Uh, One is this. 
that when we talk about loving our church family, this is something, if you've been around here very long, you know this, this issue of love within the body of Christ is something that for over two decades at North Asheville, we have put a very high premium on this characteristic, on this quality. We have said loving one another is a superlative. This is a value that we cherish and that we want to make sure that we're constantly reinforcing among our church family, that we are a community marked by love. We value that very highly. The second thing is this. I believe that this is a value that we can celebrate at North Asheville as, as something where we have a lot of blessing, where there's a lot of success, where we really are a church that is very loving. I, mean, I have to tell you, I know a lot of churches, I go into a number of churches, I know a lot of pastors. To find a place where there is a love that exists among the people that is similar to North Asheville is a very uncommon thing. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about any church, I'm celebrating what God is doing here. So praise God for the fact that I really believe that we do this in a way that really honors God and that the Spirit of God is creating this, okay? So with that said, I want to celebrate it and say, hey, praise God, he's doing some good things here in this, in this world. But at the other, uh, you know, on the other hand, I can't say, okay, so you're dismissed because you don't need this passage because we got this. We can't say that. We all need to grow in this. So I want you to pay close attention to how the Bible gives commands about love this person this way, have this heart attitude to be able to love others. Romans chapter 12, let's begin reading in verse number 9. Verse 9 says, let love be without dissimulation. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Love authentically, love genuinely. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Do not be slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Skip to verse 15, please since we dealt with verse 14 last week. Verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now again, a lot of commands, very rapid fire, do this, love that way, love this person this way, do this, do that, do the other. Lots of commands in there, and we need to pull them apart. Before we do that, though, I want you to think about, the, draw the contrast from how the Bible says that Christians are to love compared to how the world loves. Think of the way that you loved before you met Jesus. Or think of people that you and I know who don't know Christ, and think of the ways that they love. Primarily, in the world, love is driven by emotion. So in the world, I feel something, and as a result of what I feel, then I begin to act in love. It's an emotion which causes me to say I love something or I love someone. It's driven by emotion, and in the world, love is primarily reciprocal. What I mean by that is, it's a reactive kind of love. In the world, if you love me, I'll love you. If you act lovingly toward me, I will act lovingly toward you. As long as you're being uh, uh, someone who loves me, then I will be someone who loves you. So it's an emotion-based, reactive sort of uh, love. The third way that the world loves is that it's circumstantial. In the world, we say, I love you today, but I can't promise you anything for tomorrow because my circumstance might change tomorrow. Something may change in the way I feel. You may do something. I may do something. Somebody else may do something. I may meet somebody else, whatever. But tomorrow could be different. And so I know that I love you today, and that's all that I can promise you. So this is the way we love in the world when we don't know Christ. Emotional, reciprocal, circumstantial. But in the body of Christ, we are commanded to love a completely different way. We are commanded to love by a Bible standard where we love by command rather than loving by emotion. See, here's the contrast. In the world, I feel, and as a result of what I feel, I love. What the Bible says to Christ followers is you love regardless of how you feel. And you choose to love and trust God 
that in obedience, because of your obedience, the reward will come and your feelings will follow your action. We're called to love on command. We're called to love first, so it's not reactive. In the church, we're called to be the one who loves regardless of how someone responds to us in love. And we're also commanded to be sure that we love unconditionally, that our love is not circumstantial. It is a love that goes forward unconditionally and, uh, and that's empowered by the Spirit. So the difference is this, and it's a world of difference, that in the world, people love with fluidity. It's uncertain. It's moving. It's in constant change. It's not sure. But in the church, our love ought to be steady, solid, dependable. So we stand in love as opposed to being swept by love. If you see the difference, if you're tracking with me, would you say amen? Now this is the way Christ has loved us, and this is the way that we are commanded to love. So when you begin to think about the difference in the way the world loves and the way that we should love, and and you begin to look at these commands in Romans chapter number 12, you'll begin to find out that there are some choices, some steady biblically mandated, firm choices that Christ's followers ought to make regarding how we love. I want you to write these things down. He tells us in verse number 9 that we should love one another by choosing goodness. Now write it down, and then I'm going to tell you what I mean. Love one another by choosing goodness. While you're writing that, I want you to know that this command is foundational to the rest. In other words, when we get to the next few verses, you will not be able to do them, you will not be able to obey them if you don't get this one first. Because this is the the beginning point. This enables the others, okay? We love one another by choosing goodness. I want you to, if you're a note taker, most of you are, I want you to circle in verse number 9 two words. You've got a pen in your hand. Circle the word evil. He says, abhor that which is evil. And then circle the word good. Cleave to that which is good. And then you ought to draw a line between those two words, evil and good. Immediately upon giving us commands about loving one another, Paul makes a distinction between what is good and what is evil. And it's more than differentiating between uh, good acts and evil acts or good things and bad things. What he is doing is he is drawing the difference between literally what comes from hell in our relationships and what comes from heaven in our relationships. He says that we are to abhor what is evil. The word that's translated evil in this verse is literally a word which means the evil one. Now I want you to think about this. Abhor in your relationships, hate... In, your, in the ways in which you love one another and relate to one another, hate what comes from the evil one. That's the point he's making. He is telling us that there is a kingdom dynamic, a spiritual dimension to the ways that we relate to one another. And when he uses the word evil, he uses the exact same word that he used in, in Luke chapter number 11. You, you remember Luke 11 when Jesus gives the model prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer? And uh, he says, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from what? It literally means from the evil one. Deliver us from Satan. God, keep us from the power of hell. That's what the word means. It's a totally different word than what he uses in verse 17. In verse 17, he uses a word which means the harm that comes. But in verse number 9, he's talking about the, the source of the harm. He says, abhor in your relationships what comes from hell. Now, here's what all of us need to know. In all of our relationships with our family, with our church family, there is an influence from hell which seeks to destroy the love of God in our relationships. And so he says, understand there's a spiritual dynamic to the way that you love each other. And then he uses the word good. The other word in verse number 9 is good. He says, abhor that which is evil, cleave to or join or participate in that which is good. It's the same word used in Matthew chapter number 19, verse 17, when Jesus says there is none good but God. It means that which comes from God. So think about it. 
When Paul says love one another and do so by hating what is evil and choosing what is good, hating what comes from hell, choosing what comes from heaven, this is more than a command of let's all be nice to each other, isn't it? I mean, isn't that somehow sometimes how we define love? Like in our relationships, let's just be nice. Let's just get along. Let's just not talk about it. Let's just sweep things under the rug. Let's just pretend there's not a problem. Let's just keep the peace. Let's just don't rock the boat. And this is what we call love. And that is not love at all. He says, recognize there's a kingdom involvement here, a spiritual realm. And you need to know that in your relationships, it's more than being nice. It is understanding that when you choose love, you are bringing the life of God into that relationship. And when you fail to love, you are bringing the destruction of hell into that relationship. I think this is affirmed in Psalm 133, verse 1. I want to put it on the screen for you. So actually, verses 1 through 3, we sort of put it together. But this is what it says. How good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When there's love and unity uh, in the body, that's a beautiful thing because this is where God gives the blessing of life. That's what Psalm 133 says. That there's, a, there's a kingdom dynamic here. That when we abhor what comes from hell and we embrace what comes from God, then there is life and blessing that pours out there. That love and unity are holy and they bring blessing. And that disunity and division are evil and they will destroy others. So the command is love one another by resisting in your relationship what comes from hell and embracing in your relationships what comes from heaven. Now, once you begin to have that understanding that, that this is not just I like him, he likes me, I like her, we're kind of getting along. But no, there's, there's, there's a spiritual realm here. Then you'll begin to say that verse number 10 is incredibly important because I have a responsibility here because there's eternal ramifications to this. And so look at what he says in verse number 10. Verse number 10, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. He says that when you understand what's riding, what's, what's hanging in the balance here in the way that we love each other, then you will recognize that it is your responsibility in verse number 10 to love one another through devotion. Write it down this way. The command of verse 10 is that in our relationships, we need to devote ourselves to love others. Devote yourself to love others. Verse number 10, be kindly affection one to another. It means be lovingly devoted to love others. This is an attitude of the heart, loved ones. This is a surrendered life that says, I will, because I understand that the power of heaven and hell are at work in this relationship. It will bring blessing and life and glory to God, or this relationship will bring death and destruction and diminish the glory of God. When I understand that as a follower of Jesus, we must make a decision that we will devote ourselves to love others regardless of what they do or don't do. Remember, the world loves conditionally, reactively, reciprocally. When, when they reciprocate love, he says, in the church, you make a decision. Husband, listen closely to what I'm going to tell you. Every husband in this room needs to make a decision that I will devote myself to love my wife regardless of how my, life, why my wife responds to me or what she does. I will love my wife. Every wife needs to devote herself to loving her husband. Parents must devote themselves to loving their children and vice versa. And in the body of Christ, we must devote ourselves to loving one another because the power of heaven and hell is in the way that we love each other. If you understand, say amen. This is huge. So it doesn't matter what you do or don't do. I am devoted to love. And the word devoted means that I will be harmless. I will not harm you. A wonderful illustration of this in the Old Testament where it's where uh, David and Jonathan are close friends, and Jonathan's the son of Saul, and Saul wants to kill David, as you know, and, and David's a bit concerned that maybe, maybe Jonathan will, in allegiance to his father, turn on him and take his life, and there's a beautiful scene where, where Jonathan lays his sword down at David's feet, and he's simply saying, David, if you ever get wounded, it won't be from me. I won't wound you. I'm devoted to you. And wouldn't it be a wonderful marriage 
If both spouses would say, I'm devoted to not wounding you. I'm committed to not harming you. And wouldn't it be a wonderful church if every person in that church would say, I'm devoted in love to not harming anyone in this place. I'm devoted to loving you. He says, devote yourself to others. And then the other thing that he says in verse 10 is to devalue yourself in relation to others. Read verse number 10. He makes it very, very clear. Be kindly affection one to another uh, with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. When he says preferring one another, he's saying that, that, that we devalue ourselves in our relationships. Now, I didn't say devalue yourself like, oh, I'm nothing, I'm low, I'm, 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 a, I'm a worthless uh, human being. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying in your relationships, you devalue yourself and increase the value of others. So in every relationship, I I understand the power of hell and heaven. I'm going to love you by choosing what is good, abhorring what is evil. I will never harm you. And in our relationship, I will always elevate you and diminish myself. Is this going to be a wonderful relationship when everybody in the relationship says, no, your way. No, I want to bless you. No, I want to honor you. No, it's not about me. It's about you. No, how can we help you? No, how can we grow you? How can we bless you? Do you understand? And this is a totally unworldly way for people to relate to one another. And when we do that, when we make that decision because we abhor what comes from hell and we love what comes from heaven and we devote ourselves to, uh, to never harming and we value one another, then the next few commands can happen. But I'm telling you, if you don't get that first one, if you don't surrender to that, then you might as well forget the next two because they're going to be impossible But let's assume that we've got the first one, and I want you to write down the next one. So he says, number one, we love one another by choosing goodness. That's what we've been talking about. The second thing that he says is that we love one another by serving. We love one another by serving. This means that love is a labor. You've heard of a labor of love? Love is always a labor. Always. Love is work. And it's not just in terms of you've got to work at love. Love means that you work, you labor to benefit the one that you love. You serve them. Uh, verse number 11. Verse 11 says, do not be slothful in business. What it means is, do not lack zeal in this business of serving the Lord. Be an enthusiastic slave of the Lord. Do not be slothful in business or lazy when it comes to serving the Lord, but rather be fervent in spirit as you serve the Lord. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that when we love, we serve. Hey, can we talk about church ministry for just a minute? When I first went into ministry, 26, 27 years ago, when I first went into ministry, my pastor told me, my teachers in Bible college told me, every experienced pastor told me, get ready, Jim, here's the way it is in the world of pastoring. Most people in the church don't serve, they don't get their hands dirty, and it's an 80-20 rule. 80% of the people will never do anything in terms of serving God, and 20% of the people will carry the weight of ministry. 20% of the people do uh, do 80% of the work. I was told that immediately. And my experience in ministry has been that in in places and in times. Now, I want to stop and say it's not that at North Asheville. Thank God for that, although we're not all that we should be, but it's certainly not that rule. But here's what I want you to know. Any church... If you're listening, say amen. Any church where the majority of people in that church do not serve the remainder of the people in that church is a church where the love of God is absent or diminishing in that place. The absence of serving is the leading indicator of the lack of love among the people. When we love we serve. When we value others above ourselves, we serve those whom we elevate. When we elevate ourselves above others, we think we ought to be served, and they ought to demonstrate their love by serving us. And so we love others by choosing to serve. One of the goals we have in our church for 2013 is we want to reach, I think it's 850 adults who have their hands on kingdom work, who are serving on a ministry team, on a schedule, on a routine, on a a regular basis, they are serving in ministry. And we're going to push hard for that goal because the body of Christ loves one another by serving. 
And if you're sitting here going, uh, well, I don't know how to serve, and I don't know where to serve, and I don't know how to plug in, I don't know what my next step is, hey, on the back of your connection card, there's a box. You can check it. It says, I want to serve. And I'll promise you, we'll help you find a place to serve, okay? But we love one another by serving. So it says, love each other by choosing what is good, what brings life, and then understand that loving means that I serve. You should never say, I attend North Asheville Baptist Church. You should say, I serve Christ at North Asheville Baptist Church. Lastly, he says that we ought to love one another by choosing goodness. We love one another by serving one another. And thirdly, we love one another by lifting one another. We love by lifting. This is the fellowship of love. So I choose to love. That means I engage in service. And then secondly, it means that I engage in fellowship to love. I love that verse number 10 mentions the fact that we are brothers. We're sisters. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Love one another like brothers, preferring one another. We are family. We call one another brother, sister. God is our father. We're, we're a family of faith. And all of us know that in a family, every nuclear family in a home, every church family, there's always somebody in that family who's hurting, isn't there? Uh, there's always, you know, families and churches go through seasons. And there are deep valleys and there are distresses and there are problems and illnesses and things that come. And, and so there are difficulties. And in any family, when someone is hurting, the way that we dem- demonstrate love for them, those who are hurting is that we don't let them hurt alone. We lift them. And we walk through it with them. In our closing few minutes, and I've only got about four or five minutes left with you, so in our closing few minutes, what I want to do is work down through verse number 12, 13, 15, and 16, real quickly. And I want to show you commands of lifting, how it is that we lift one another and we demonstrate love. Write them down quickly. The first one is this. He says that we lift one another by bringing the hope of joy. Bringing, I said it backwards, bringing the joy of hope. Bringing the joy of hope. Verse number Uh, 12, that in our relationships, the context is clear here, in our relationships we are rejoicing in hope. That when someone in the family is hurting, our role is to love them by lifting them. Not to kick them when they're down, not to leave them alone, but to come to them and to make sure that that we are pointing them toward hope. That when someone is hurting, this is a place where they are constantly pointed toward hope. I'm going through a tough time. I know, brother, but let me point you to hope. There's hope in Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to get through. I see where you're at, but let me tell you there's hope in Jesus. So we're constantly, this ought to be the most hopeful place in town where folks find hope even in the deepest valleys when they they come to this place when they're loved here. Bring the joy of hope. Number two, we love people and lift them by remaining faithful through all hardships. Verse number 12. In your relationships, be patient in tribulation. The word patient means that you refuse to leave, that you stay close, that you're faithful to people who are hurting. Have you ever walked through a tough time and suddenly the people that you thought would be there to help you through that tough time weren't there? I mean, like they went AWOL, they disappeared. Bad news came to your life and you thought, man, if I ever get get into trouble, if I'm ever hurting... I can count on you know, this person, that person, and, and suddenly they won't return your phone calls. They're not calling. They're not, they're not responding to your emails. You go, what in the world? What happened? Well, very often what happens is they're afraid, and they don't know what to say, and they'd rather not say anything than say the wrong thing, so they just sort of pull back, and they kind of go silent. I'm going to tell you, that's the wrong strategy. That's not a loving strategy. What we are to do when someone in our family is hurting is that we rush to their aid, and we never leave our wounded on the battlefield. We always remain faithful. And this ought to be a place where people know that when I am hurting, I will never hurt alone. My church family, my life group, those people around me, they will walk through it with me. Number three, he says, in your relationships, we love by lifting and we do that by praying until the victory comes. Verse number 12, continue instant, never stop. Continue instant, always praying. Continuing instant in prayer. We don't give up on the hope of prayer. We lift one another through prayer. One of the greatest ways to love each other 
You may say, well, I can't do anything, and I, I, I don't know how I can serve, and I'm not sure how I can lift anybody. Everybody can pray, and you can lift folks and love them by praying for them. Number four, he says that we should share what we have with those in need. Look at verse number 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. He says when people in the family are hurting, we help. We're, we're willing to distribute to that. Now that, that might mean that you know, somebody's hurting, we give them some money. That might mean that, but maybe you don't have the ability to do that. But simply put, here's what it means is this. It means that everybody in the family knows that when I walk through a hard place, I won't walk through it alone because what I need is my brother's need. We have a mentality, we want to have a mentality in our church which says that nobody ever suffers a need in this church, that we don't all suffer. We all carry the burden together. And when someone has a need, we're there. We distribute to that need. Uh, Then number five, we need to quickly welcome those who are strangers. Quickly welcome those who are strangers. He says in verse number 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints and then given to hospitality. I love this little command, and, and sometimes there's a lot of confusion about it. What does he mean, given to hospitality? Some people think, well, that means I've got I to open my home all the time. I've got to be hospitable at home. Well, that, it might mean some of that. Somebody said to me one time, they said, I think that means I have to pick up hitchhikers. I'm driving my hitchhiker. I've got to be hospitable. I've got to pick him up. Now, that's kind of scary. Well, th- that's probably not exactly what it means. But here's what it means. Be quick to show friendship to people who are not your friends. That, that's the, quick, the best way I know to say it. Be quick to show friendship to people who are not your friends. Do you know, sometimes, and again, I love what God is doing in our church, and I don't think this is really a problem here, but we have to be careful about it, that sometimes the loneliest place to be can be by yourself in a big crowd where everybody around you knows other people, and they're all loving each other and shaking hands and hugging necks and enjoying a good conversation, and you're just kind of weaving your way through the little circles of people because you don't know anybody and nobody knows you. And he says, in the body of Christ, here's the way that we love, that we show hospitality. It, people don't have to be our close friends in order to be welcomed into our fellowship and into our love, that we welcome even those who we don't know well. So here's your homework before you leave. This is, not, this is church work. This is before you leave today. That what I want you to do is find somebody on your way out that you don't know very well and just say, hey, good morning, and welcome and introduce yourself and show kindness to somebody even that you don't know very well and, um, and be quick to show hospitality. I have to give you the last one. I'm out of time, and that is that we need to be genuinely interested in what others are facing. This is verse number 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Have genuine empathy for those who are hurting, and genuine joy for those who are rejoicing. What, what do we do too often when people rejoice? We envy. We, 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 we didn't get what they got. And so we're like, well, I'm not too happy for them. I wish I'd gotten some of that. No. He says when you love them, you're, you're, you're thrilled that God's blessing them. And you're celebrating. And then when someone is weeping, you're, you're never going, well, that's your deal. That's not my problem. No. That's your problem too. And you're weeping with them. These are the ways in which we love. All of which is tied up in verse number 16 with a heart of humility. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Do not be wise in your own conceits. All of this flows from a humble heart of love for Christ and love for others. Now, we're going to close our time in prayer, but I simply want you to know that if we know Christ, we have been loved with an everlasting love. And when we love like the world loves, conditionally when we love like the world loves, only reciprocating when someone loves us, when we love like the world loves uh, uh, circumstantially, today but I can't promise you tomorrow, then our lives look no different than the lives around us. But when we love in these ways, lifting, laboring, uh, valuing others higher than ourselves, when we love this way, bringing the power of heaven in our relationships, then God is glorified, the kingdom is advanced, And Jesus is praised.